Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I begin, I want to thank certain people. Historic Commission, Historic Society, uh, Nelson Dyan of Salem, who provided material from the Salem side, um, and of course, uh, the group that's assembled here uh, today. Those who have heard me before know exactly what I'm going to say. My dad um, would go to church, and if the minister was speaking too long, my father tapped his watch. And the longer he went, the higher the watch went, and the lower I went in the pew. I used to tell that to my students, and the moment I went into the classroom, they'd start. So I'm going to be watching you, because my dad's philosophy was, the mind can absorb only what the seat can endure. So with that in mind, I'll watch you very carefully and we'll see if you start tapping. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here uh, tonight. And it's fun because uh, this place that we call Lead Mill, most of us take for granted. If we're leaving town in the morning, we quickly glaze over it, checking Salem Harbor for tides and weather. The late afternoon, we're greeted by it when we come around the Marblehead Harbor Bend. We measure, or I measure the distance from their home, 10 minutes. I also learned coming from Topsfield, often in the summer, the moment I reached that point, it was 10 degrees cooler. <laughs> and it felt nice to be welcomed to Marblehead by the temperature dropping. We forget that we are walking or driving in the footsteps of our earliest citizens. Today I'm going to take you back in time, but I'm going to remind you that this location has been used, occupied, and loved by hundreds of people. For hundreds of years before the white European arrival, Native Americans traveled to Marblehead. That's the beginning of our tourist season. Here at what we call the lead mills, summer encampments were erected along the shoreline, anywhere from the lead mill all the way up to Peaches Point. Hundreds of clay pots, uh, shards, fluted points, stone celts, sinkers, hatchets, spear points, bone implements, and shell bracelets have been uncovered over the years. Many of these artifacts date back to what we call the traditional archaic period. That's 6,000 to 2,700 BCE. Politically, that means before the Common Era. So if you think about that, the occupants of that land go back 6,000 years plus our 2,000. We're talking about tourists coming for 8,000 years to the lead mills. Native American fortifications and encampments have come all the way from Legs Hill, along the Salem Harbor, all the way to Peaches Point. In the early 1800, Marblehead farmers found a huge 50 to 60 foot shell heap located in the area, almost up to Indian Cove. That's about a quarter of a mile from where we're talking about. The piles were 10 to 12 feet high. They contain 30 to 100 cords, uh, um, roughly 80 bushels to a cord, of clamshells and burnt stones. It was estimated it took 50 to 100 years to accumulate those piles. Now those Native Americans must have enjoyed clams and lobsters along that shore. Well, Marble Headers would never let anything go to waste, and so the farmers in the 1850s began taking the shells, grinding them up, and using them for fertilizer. In 1869, Henry Sears from the Peabody Museum at Harvard uh, University and Essex Institute took pictures of that area, and they began an excavation. Later on, uh, James H. Gregory, uh, from the famous bell at Marblehead, the Seed King often explored this area. In 1915, expedition 
from Phillips uh, Andover Academy, and Marblehead is Wallace Weed and Charles Broughton conducted their own private excavation in that area. They recovered a hundred artifacts plus several bushes of stone flakes. As late as 1920, Marbleheaders were reporting the outline of Native American encampments from there up to Buddy Swamp. How many of you know where Buddy Swamp is? If you go a little bit further beyond the lead mill, there's an old abandoned lake area and that's called Buddy Swamp. Linda and I, my wife sitting over there, know that very well because our son fell through the ice while skating there and went under the ice. And had it not been for the dog with him, and he looked out and saw the dog's legs, he swam over, and that's where the dog was at the opening in the ice. So we know Buddy Swamp very well. Um, 2006, there is an archaeological investigation of the lead mill. They found the area to be compromised by uh, industrial land use. Well, not long after these encampments stopped, new immigrants occupied the area. In 1637, there's a record of John Getchell, a hard of hearing farmer who built a wigwam on the exact location. He and his wife, uh, Waysboro, raised a family of five sons and three daughters. John must have been quite a character. Of course, his last name was Getchell. <laughs> the year he built his home, he's fined 10 shillings for building on town land. Getchell, although later a town constable and selectman, was fined for trespassing for in 1645 on town land. By the way, he could have had his fines reduced if he cut his long hair. <laughs> the lands at that point were owned by Salem, and thus they got to tax Getchell. Even after the creation of the town of Marblehead, John Getchell continues at separate times to be fined for abusing the town constable, breaking the peace, and for speaking out against government, for which he was sentenced to be whipped. His eldest son, Joseph Getchell, who lived on the property, was ordered to be placed in the stocks in Marblehead for blasphemy and to have his tongue pierced, followed by imprisonment. The third old's brother, Jeremiah, paid the fines to save his brother. That area must have been a hotbed for free speech, free action, and free thought. <laughs> Things haven't changed in Marblehead, have they? On February 1682, these are record that Jeremiah, that third son, inherits the property. Jeremiah is listed as a wheelwright. He and his wife Elizabeth raised their five sons and four daughters. He began buying up property there. In fact, he bought property from a guy named John Debro, unusual name. <laughs> that property he bought belonged to Reverend Hugh Peters. Reverend Hugh Peters had been a member of parliament in England, had signed the death warrant for Charles I, and had quickly left England when they were talking about bringing back the king's son. Well, Peters left Marblehead and went back to England just in time for Charles II to come on the throne. Peters was tried, condemned, and suffered a traitor's death. His land became open, Devereux sold it, Getchell bought it. Well, about that time, a man appears on the scene, a Salemite named John Gardner. And with Jeremiah Getchell, he built a grist mill in 1734. Gardner received this land from a grant from Salem. Within three years, Getchell and Gardner requested that the town of Salem build a cart bridge across the Forest River. Uh, it doesn't sound like much to us, but it was an incredible improvement. What it did, it changed the main road to Salem instead of going up to Legs Hill and cutting across that little bridge that I cross over. 
the road now came past the mills. Uh, by the way, uh, Salem built that cart bridge in 10 years. They were taken to court for failure to maintain the bridge. <laughs> Gardner must have supplied the financial backing for that grist mill. Uh, because Getchell is listed as owning one third of the mill, Gardner owned two thirds. I think Gardner, because his background as a Wainwright, provided the technical knowledge. In fact, from that point on, all records in Marblehead refer to as Gardner's Mills. Well, the grist mill and the granary consisted of a dam that would have been on the side of the pond, not the harbor. Uh, and of millstones, gears, tools, a pond, and a flow of water power. It's described as a timber frame building atop a dam with a set of gates using the power from trap water from the mill pond, which turned the grindstones that ground the Indian corn into meal. Well, Jeremiah's third son ends up inheriting the property. And the fascinating story is that his daughter, Mary, marries an individual known as Samuel Tucker. And she does it in 1768. The mill and the property remain with the Getchells and the Ingalls until Samuel Tucker appears in the scene. How many know Commodore Samuel Tucker? Oh, know of him. One, two. Commodore Samuel Tucker. Born in Marblehead, in fact, uh, born in the tavern uh, across from the old high school up on the hill. Tucker, in, during the American Revolution, went to sea. He's noted in the book by Adams as taking John Adams on the trip to France and back. By the time the revolution ended, Commodore Samuel Tucker had captured 41 British vessels. He was a fairly wealthy man. At the end of the revolution, he retires and he moves to scenic Boston. Well, there he encountered financial difficulties and so he decided to come home. So in 1786, Tucker purchases Gardner's shares of the mill. With his wife and three remaining children, he runs the mill. Well, as a seaman, I'm sure he tired of being a miller. He never really retired from the sea. We have a record of him pensioning President John Adams and Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton for a commission for one of the new revenue, uh, revenue cutters. Well, they didn't give it to him. Like a good marble header, he got angry and he said, I'm moving out of town. He moved to Bristol, Maine, and he died there in 1833. However, before he left, he sold the property. But I want to give you a side note. While Tucker is there, there's a gentleman known as John Glover. Anybody hear his name? John Glover had incredible ideas to make money. First of all, he was going to put a, can uh, a canal from the lead mill all the way up through the pond, Forest River, up to his farm up in the Vinan Square area. Must have been quite an enterprise. Glover also said he was going to put a salt mill at Riverhead Beach. Neither of these enterprises went anywhere and so Tucker sold the property and we have an individual known as Isaac Wyman who's also a revolutionary veteran. Now you know where the term Wyman's Woods comes from because the Wyman family moves into the area. Uh, what happens here is immediately Wyman demolishes the mill and the house. In fact, uh, there's a story told that he builds the new mill and the dam and he puts it to work grinding flour and grain plus the making of graphite. Well, I wouldn't want graphite to be mixed with my grain. But as a side note, one of his workers was named Dixon. 
And Dixon took the concept of graphite and developed the pencil. And it's interesting that his training came from that mill. Well, by now, all the town records call it Wyman's Mills. And all the way up the hill is Wyman's Woods, Wyman's Farm. He and his, he and his wife decided that they're going to sell the, some of the property. So he sells to an individual known as Francis Peabody. Well, Peabody is a wealthy merchant, and he had an eye for investment. So Peabody, in 1831, buys the property we know as Lead Mill for $4,600. Pretty good bargain when you consider that. Wyman retained the right through the mill property to his farm property, the use of the well, and an access to Salem Harbor. Okay. Pretty good farmer. Peabody, cousin to the famous George Peabody, with others, founds the Forest Lead Company in South Salem and Middleton. From his many investments, he built the Kernwood Estate, which we now know as the Kernwood Country Club. Beautiful home. Later, by the way, uh, Peabody serves as the president of Essex Institute. Peabody uses the mill to grind and mix lead for white lead paint pigment and for sheet lead. The corroding was done in South Salem, located on LaGrange Street. Well, within a short period of time, that grill mill continues, but they close down the South Salem uh, factory and they move all the buildings to the lead mill property. There is a story, and I don't know how true it is, that they took the millstones from that mill and moved it to the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord, Massachusetts. So if you go there to visit Hawthorne or some of the others, they're not going to say very much, by the way, um, you're going to see those millstones in the cemetery. By 1846, the Forest River Lead Company is officially created. The South Salem, of course, is closed, and the work takes place at the lead mill. Most of the material needed for the lead mill was transported by ship through Salem Harbor. Understanding the need for better transportation lead material and a need for transportation for the town of Marblehead, the Eastern Railroad opened a three-mile branch from the Salem line on December 10th, 1839. By the way, they had no problem. They put stocks up in the amount of $40,000 and they were able to build a branch line from the Salem line straight into where the National Grand Bank is today. And for those who remember it, the train station set up on the hill. In order to cross the, the Forest River area, the Eastern Railroad wrote, uh, built a pile bridge 350 feet long with a side spur into the mills. And because of the weight of the material as well as the passengers coming out of Marblehead, they had to replace the wooden rails with metallic rails in 1844. When you go out, make sure you stop and look at the picture that's shown for 1860. And you will see a railroad wooden bridge going across that area, 350 feet. And the artist took a little bit of license. In the locomotive, you're going to look at the name, and it's as far as River Lead Mills. No locomotive ever had that name. <laughs> Now, what was it like to be there in the 1840s? Well, it's Hay Point, or High Point. There's a lead mill, huge building, four stories. The side buildings connected all the way over the Salem line, right up to where the tracks were. There's a white and sheet metal area. There's a solid wharf built out into Salem Harbor. 
there's an engine room, a coal shed, a drying room, a large corroding house, a vinegar house. You want to know why? Stop and look at the Dutch method as to how the lead is made. Five dwellings and a well and a vegetable garden. In fact, you want to make sure you look at the Dutch method of making white lead. It's fascinating. In 1850 census, we see workers from the mill living in those five farmhouses tucked way back. The next federal census in 1860 shows one Irish worker and all the rest is workers from New Hampshire. Uh, it's interesting because if you look uh, 10 years later, every one of the mill workers now living on the property are Irish. And it's just reflecting the time periods in terms of people coming to New Hampshire in the early part, finding work, and then an immigrant population coming and working at that mill property. By the way, to think it's just a small mill, in 1879, the mill is producing 1,000 tons of white lead annually. That's a massive amount. In 1888, the mills now change hands. They're purchased by a Boston um, merchant named Joseph Chadwick. Uh, Chadwick was the owner of the Chadwick Lead Mills of Boston. He renames this area the Forest River Chadwick Lead Works. By this stage, the mills are producing 6,000 tons of lead annually. By 1860, all of the five buildings in back are being used by workers or local farmers. Further expansion continued. In 1893, they begin to fill in some of that Forest River area. They take down some of the buildings that went over the Forest River. In fact, um, uh, they fill in some of the flat area there. I'm not sure I want it named after me, but it was called the Isaac Wyman Flats. And then they build a new seawall in 1904. And then, as if anything was good, tragedy strikes. March 5th, 1897. A night watchman at 8 p.m. discovers a fire in the north east corner of the main building. Box 19, the only box that Salem and Marblehead respond to, is at the lead mill. Fire companies come from Marblehead and Salem. For three hours that fire burned. <coughs> it was contained to the main building. Marblehead uh, engine, the William R. Lee, lays two lines and they keep the other buildings from catching fire. Thousands of people from Marblehead and Salem come to see the fire. Just wait, we've got another one coming. <laughs> At the end of the fire, they determine that the loss is $25,000. That's for a piece of property purchased for $4,600. By the time they started rebuilding, they determined it was a $40,000 loss. It's only a short period of time that this mill is going to continue. Considering it's the largest mill in the area that's producing 12 tons of lead on a weekday, it put 50 people out of work. It had a major effect in the economy for the town of Marblehead. The same year, there's a court case that appears before the Mass Judicial Court. Salem is claiming the right to tax it. Marblehead is claiming the right to tax it. Marblehead said they owned from the shore up to the high water mark. Salem said we own everything over to the Marblehead line. Well, there's a justice whose name is Oliver Wendell Holmes who decides the case in favor of Salem. Well, rebuilding took place 1899. They've rebuilt the bridge, which now requires widening Lafayette Street. 1901, it's officially merged with the Boston Lead Company. Different reports uh, claim that the mill is closed in 1906 or in 1908. By, all that by that time, all the machines inside the building 
have been moved to Roxbury. A leather firm decides they're going to use the structure, but a lack of proper sewage stops the leather company. The building sits vacant. The Salem News, we getting closer to us, by the way, on July 13, 1915, announces a rumor that the mill would be used as a factor to manufacture English shrapnel for World War I. Of course, they would have called it the European War. August 10th, the Salem News again announces another rumor. The American Steam Gauge and, and Valve Company of Boston is going to renovate it. The very next week, the Salem News reports another rumor. John Madden of Lynn has a contract with the Russian Army to make ammunition for the Allies. And he points out in the Salem News that there's just two boilers left and there's a sidetrack going to the brick engine house. Major advantage, they had about 25,000 square feet that they could use. It promised employment for 3,000 people. Think of that. The population of Marblehead in 1915, 3,000 between Salem and Marblehead would be working in that factory. Again, April 6, 1917, they report that Rogers Shear Company of Warren, Pennsylvania was going to set up a dry color manufacturing firm. Nothing came from any of the rumors. In fact, in the 1920s, we still find people living in those back structures. In fact, during that time, a field stone wall is built from the shoreline into the harbor. It's constructed by A.E. Little, Saros Farms. He owns the adjacent property and he wants to keep his hybrid sheep from getting into the mill's vegetable garden. <laughs> so this wall, a close line of large boulders, is extended from the shore through the flats to the low tide line. And by the way, at low tide, look, and you can see part of that. Well, sheep aren't stupid. <laughs> they were not stopped by muddy feet. They simply walked out onto the muddy flats, around the stone wall, and into the garden. <laughs> A little was not very happy. In 1923, we find the mill being conveyed to the United Lead Company. They're looking at it because this structure had an elevator with now 4,000 square feet. The long search was on again for an occupant. In 1943, Sylvania hires the mill for storage. In 1945, the National Boston Lead Company still owned the property, but within a month, they're taken over by the Essex Acceptance Corporation. I'm sure there's a little bit of finance in terms of money not being paid. My brother told me he went there for shooting lessons. There was a shooting range set in the back of the big mill factory, and that's where he learned to shoot a rifle. The sole remaining building that we know was finally sold in 1947 to Associated Grocers. The structure was used for storage, but there were still families living in those homes as late as the early 60s. These residents considered the area home. They were still drawing water from the well. They still had their vegetable garden. And then comes what everyone here over 50 years of age would remember. A st spectacular fire. February 22nd, 1968. It produced numerous photographs. You see one of them out there. Everybody turned out to see the blaze. Marblehead and fire officials long talked about this fire saying it's going to happen. In fact, Salem Fire Chief James Brennan and Fire Chief Ed Creighton often spoke about the future fire by saying that Creighton could sell tickets in Marblehead and Brennan could sell them in Salem. 
during the actual fire, which was discovered at 7.43 in the evening, when every window is lit up with flames, one of Brennan's aides comes over to Chief Graydon and says, Brennan's out of tickets, have you got any left? <laughs> the mill was a total loss. The next morning, what appeared to be a chimney was still standing. Uh, I remember going past, coming down that hill, and all the water that had been expended to put out that fire was ice on the road. The property remained vacant. 1996 has reported that it's badly flooded. By 2000, the National Lead Industries, the successor of the old Chadwick Company, begins paying fees as the owner of the area. In the early 2000s, developers began looking at the property. Well, March 2002, we have Glover Estate showing an interest to put 44 units up. In 2005, KSS developers offer a plan for 30 units. Citizen opposition responded, nothing happened, and the lot continued to remain vacant. In October 2010, Woodward and Curran began a cleanup. Eastern section is chemically treated, the western section is excavated and the soil removed. By 2001, Marblehead jointly with Salem receive a grant, P-A-R-C, let's see if I get it right, Parkland Acquisitions and Renovations for Communities. Purchase of the property had to happen before March 31st. Hmm. Salem came up with money. Marblehead had to go to town meeting. And June town meeting approved it. Went to an override. And the override was successful. Seeding of the property began in 2012. 2014, a study is made with recommendations as what to do with the property. And this came from the Conway School. Today, as you saw, the lead mill conservation area comprised of 4.5 acres is reserved for passive recreational use only. Guided tours of kids, service and conservation projects, and an open space for clean air are only part of its potential use. This beautiful location is the first thing the tourists see of Marblehead and the last thing they see of Salem. Its beauty and its natural look speaks to the character of Marblehead and of Salem. From the independence of the Getchell family, from the Tuckers and Wyman struggling to make a living, from Peabody and the others who had a vision, from the businessmen who ran the mills, from the workers who called this home. We have become the heirs of that heritage. This property belongs to us. It belongs to you. And you know, we shouldn't use the term we call this property, lead mill. We should use the term our lead mill property. It is now our vision to leave this to the future citizens of Marblehead and of Salem. This will require us to truly adopt the area and to maintain its natural beauty. This is what our lead mill is to us and for us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Can I answer any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Where did the raw material for the lead come from? It's going to be, uh, well, it's going to come from all over the place. The Chadwick property came from the Boston mills in to us. Prior to that, it would be a guess on my part. I don't know, Bob. No, I don't really know either. As Don mentioned, the, uh, the uh, first lead mill is. Uh, making sheet lead and so forth was over in South Salem. Um, LaGrange Street. LaGrange Street, yeah. 
uh, right near the, the harbor's edge over there. Um, what came over here was uh, the grinding of the corrosion product, the white lead. Eventually, as Don mentioned, they brought everything over here. So where uh, the metal itself came from uh, that fed uh, to the South Salem work, don't know. I have to tell you, I, I uh, enjoy oil painting. And after doing this, every time I use a tube of white lead paint, I now think of that mill. I'm sure it doesn't come from the mill, but that it was an essential part of uh, America. Yes, back there, sir. At what point was the boundary between Marblehead and Salem in that area clearly delineated? That boundary has always been there and probably was set back in 1649. And if you notice, it cuts right through that area, okay, so that a good part of that lead mill was in Salem area and they backfilled. I can remember as a boy coming down that hill and there's a little triangle section. It's where the train line comes. It's on the Salem Harbor, Salem side. And that was an uh, outdoor motor place where you could stop and get your motor repaired. Somebody told me it was a clam shack. Across the street from that was a small uh, substation for the train line where you could catch it at the lead mill. Yes, sir. Did they ever use the harbor for water access to the lead mill? Say it once again. Did they ever use the harbor for access or it was all by train? Uh, um, did they ever use the harbor? After the trains are there, Majority of that were, were, were trains. Uh, by the way, those tracks had to be incredibly busy. You have the shoe industry producing the shoes that are going out, much of it, to Cuba, coming across those lines. You have the lead mill with 6,000 tons a year going out. So uh, that's pretty active. And the Eastern Railroad stayed in business until 1890 when they were taken over by the Boston and Maine. Uh, my grandfather worked for the Boston, Maine. We used to call it the broken and mangled. <laughs> yes? When did they first discover that lead was poisonous and could kill babies? And babies? Yes, um, and they had to be very careful. In fact, any artist knows, don't put the brush in your mouth. A lot of artists will go like this. You don't want to do that. Whether it's white lead or any other lead. Yes? I guess I'm going to have to refer to Bob on that. The answer is yes. Um, there were a great many readings taken for a wider area than is covered by the lead mills probably before any remediation would, was started. And I think there's a map out there that, that gives you an idea of the area that they actually covered during the remediation. And the, uh, the soil uh, that had to be removed because the readings were too high. Uh, extends from about a foot deep way over in the Wyman Woods end to more than four feet deep by the time that you get down near the Lafayette Street. But, but, but all of that topsoil was taken away and, and replaced. Which, by the way, side note, that's part of the problem we have in trying to figure out what actually should grow there because we're not, we don't really know where the soil came from. So you're fighting that plus the fact that you're near, near uh, salt water. But yes. There have been readings taken uh, all over that area and beyond. But no problems with groundwater, getting into groundwater or anything? Have they tested that? I don't, um, I don't recall, uh, quite frankly, I don't recall whether they actually tested for, for groundwater there. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Yes, sir. Who paid for the remediation? National Lead Industries, it's called NL Industries. They are the last, uh, don't mention them also, they, they were the last uh, owner of record. And uh, they came in and uh, offered to remediate it no matter who the, the owner was and there because they had a great deal of experience in, in dealing with this kind of problem. NL Industries still exists, by the way, and yes, they still make lead products. And EPA was also on the scene at that time. So legislation was coming down the tube. Still going to be in the scene? The area is safe enough. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Betty. John, I'm ignorant beyond belief. Lead is I mine. cannot believe that. <laughs> lead is mined from something and it comes in <coughs> in what form? <laughs> Bob, do you want to just... What do you make out of it besides oil paint? Well, okay, let, let's... let's uh, yes, um, lead is mined as, as a sulfide ore and so forth. 
and then it has to be uh, smelted and, and reduced into a form of metal. Okay, and it, so it's removed, it, it's first poured out in cast in ingots like steel is and so forth, and then ultimately that's rolled down into sheet, sheet is then rolled into tube and so forth, if that's what you're doing. But the big product, uh, the reason for locating a, um, an operation here was the creating of white lead, which is the corrosion product. You deliberately corrode lead in order to get a white flaky product in there that is then ground down, mixed with linseed oil, and that becomes uh, the uh, pigment base for paint and for some cosmetics. Now, it's, it, it's put in, almost think of a flower pot. Mm -hmm. It's put in. Well, go set. Go to a type machine. That's lead. I uh, keep in mind that factory also produce uh, lead pipes, lead sheets. Yeah, this. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you want to read as to how that Dutch process took place? It's fascinating. Gross. Probably, probably stumped, by the way, uh, because it was by and large it was a, a uh, mixture of uh, horse manure and uh, vinegar. It was set in it. That's how they did the, the corrosion, because they needed a combination of uh, acetic acid, carbonic acid, carbolic acid, and that's how you got it. And then they would take that out and scrape gotcha. off of that. And grind the scraping. Yeah. Uh, Don, because uh, I live in the neighborhood, and the flames came right up and sparks into my yard that night. I'm way over in Robert Road. Beautiful picture. Uh, no, we're afraid we're watching that our place wouldn't burn down. But the, uh, what I wanted to ask, uh, there's a natural, like a, it's not the biggest beach, but there's a natural beach there. Yes. And uh, at some point, I mean, we're good for like kayaks and small little boats. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be, you know, access freely for town residents? To well, it's going to be up to you as citizens of the town to help recommend for I mean, passive recreation. Well, that's, um, you know, somebody has a little kayak. Oh, yeah. Kind of yeah. Park. There's quite a few parking spaces on yeah. the front, so we'll have that to use. I expect to see you in a kayak. <laughs> <laughs> I have no problem getting in the kayak. I have no problem getting out of the kayak. Um, <laughs> yes. The um, early artifacts from way back, you yeah. know, the 6,000 BC. Right? Yeah, by the way, that 6,000. Yeah. Pl add another oh, 2,000 yeah. to it. You're, yeah. Anything that they found, is it, do you know where any of them are? Some of it is in the Peabody Museum at Harvard. Harvard. Some of it is at Phillips uh, Andover. Yeah. I've been out there to see some of that. Some of that went into uh, JOJ Gregory's collection that went to Amherst College. So it's scattered yeah. all over the place. I haven't seen anything at the Peabody Essex. I'm going to tell you, I, uh, a gentleman known as Bill Eldridge uh, in the 20s used to walk over that property and collect Indian artifacts for the uh, Peabody Essex. And if you go downstairs and pull out the drawers, you will see a massive amount of Native American artifacts. There are some, but remember there's a recent act on Native American in which anything that has a religious connotation should be returned. Any Native American bones have to be reburied and um, taken care of with respect. And that's legislation from the 1980s. Any other questions? Yes? So did the lead get into the vegetables that they were growing in the garden? Um, you know, I never ate a vegetable from there. <laughs> the families um, lived there. They ate the vegetables. They drank the water from the well. The only advantage is the well is, was set further back from the mill. Um, I can't respond to that not knowing it, but those vegetable gardens fed the workers uh, in those mills. Yes? Is white lead still made the same way? <laughs> I, I'm not sure. The, the, the answer is uh, yes and no. The answer is first yes, there is white lead made exactly the same way today. But there are other white leads made mostly at the request from artists because if you add other, uh, other compounds to it, you can change the texture when, and you can change the color a little bit. 
the, the original, the white lead, was considered by artists to be the whitest of whites. Okay, today, in, um, in most of that's been in the kind of things you'd know about in paints, cosmetics, so it's been replaced by titanium dioxide, which is considered not quite as white, but if you look at it, I, I could, can't tell the difference. But yes, it is still made today. And the ceramic, like the ceramics that it's made in. Um, well, yeah, um, in, in some cases, uh, some of it is made that way, but most of it is, is not. There isn't that much of it made around the world today because it's still under a great deal of restriction because of the damage it can do to your health. Yes, sir. So the buildings were four stories, I think, four or five stories. And the main building was four stories. Yeah, were they all used for the pots, uh, uh, each of those floors or different? Uh, yes, and you had a corroding house out back. You had the vinegar house. Um, wow. Not having been inside, I can't tell you. I watch from the outside lit up, but that's it. Uh, any other? Indian tribes. Wasn't there Indian tribes at the Lindmos before? Oh, say it again. Indian tribes that uh, were settled there at one time? Indians. Yes, Native Americans. Yeah. They were settled there. They were, they were settled all over Marblehead. Well, we, have but... uh, we called them nomkegs, but that's not what they called themselves. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.